One of the places we haven't talked about the fossil record so far is the Near East. The Near East is a critical junction between these major continental areas of Europe, Asia, and Africa. And it's the perfect place to ask these questions about modern human origins. Do we have continuous evolution, or do we have replacement by modern humans of pre-existing populations? As it turns out, we have a very rich fossil assemblage from the Near East coming from the late Pleistocene. This map shows you the locations of several key sites coming from the Middle East. Here we have the Sea of Galilee up north, the Dead Sea down south here, and we have a series of sites that have very rich fossil assemblages. Part of the richness of these assemblages is that there's intentional burial going on. These are all sites from the last 120,000 years, extending up to about 40,000 years, and they have, several of them, numerous preserved cranial and even postcranial remains, part of that being a process of intentional burial. What's interesting is that some of these sites preserve what are typically referred to as Neanderthal specimens, while other sites preserve what are typically referred to as modern humans. And you would think that all of the Neanderthal sites would predate those that house modern humans, but that's not the case in the Near East. Instead, we see this going back and forth of Neanderthal localities, modern human localities, Neanderthal localities, and modern human localities. Understanding this complex pattern of variation that we see in the Near East is one way of trying to wrap your head around this question of modern human origins, and whether it involves species replacement or some kind of more complex population level process in an evolving human species. Let's look at some of the fossils. So first, one of the sites that we have clear Neanderthal-like morphology is the cave site of Amud, with Amud 1 shown here on the left. Contrast this specimen to one of the classic Neanderthals from France, La Chapelle. What we see is a high nasal bone, much like we have in La Chapelle, projecting brow ridges, again like we have in La Chapelle. We have a fairly flexed occiput, or posterior portion of the skull, similar to La Chapelle. We have a little bit of an expanded mastoid process, unlike the small mastoid process we saw in La Chapelle. We also have a very large cranial vault, close to 1600 cc's, which puts it at the very high end of the human range of cranial capacity. So Amud preserves many traits which suggest that it's clearly a Neanderthal, and it exists at about 40 to 60,000 years in the Near East. We can compare Amud with other Neanderthal specimens coming from the Near East as well. Here we see Amud compared to Taboon 1, an earlier Neanderthal from the Near East. We can see similarity, for example, in the supraorbital torus of these two specimens, the double-arched, fairly projecting supraorbital torus. Notice that there's only a moderate frontal bossing on this specimen, or a low forehead, in other words, similar to other Neanderthals. Um, we have a broad palate on both specimens, something that it's a little bit difficult to see in this view, but you can get a little sense of it. Uh, Taboon has a much smaller mastoid process, similar to earlier Neanderthals, and it is, in fact, an earlier Neanderthal. So again, we can see evidence of this Neanderthal morphology, slightly different than we saw in the classic Neanderthals of Western Europe, but that makes sense given that these are later in time and found quite a bit east of those classic Neanderthals. But the overall pattern of variation in these Near Eastern specimens is far more complex than what we see in simply these two Neanderthal specimens. Here we see those Neanderthal specimens again, Taboon 1 and Amud 1 on the left, but contrasted with three specimens that are typically identified as anatomically modern Homo sapiens. School 5, which sits intermediate in time between Taboon 1 and Amud 1, and Kafsa 6 and Kafsa 9, which come later in time than Amud. And these three specimens are considered anatomically modern Homo sapiens. Notice, however, the range and variation that we see. School 5 preserves a superorbital torus very similar to what we saw in Taboon 1 and Amud. School 5 also preserves a little bit of a projecting lower face, again a primitive characteristic in this context. In contrast, the Kafsa specimens show a little bit more development, especially Kafsa 9 is a very gracile specimen with a tall forehead, a more globular cranial vault, less prognathism of the lower face, a less well-developed nasal aperture, and generally speaking, a much more modern human-like morphology. Kafsa 6, however, preserves still a little bit more archaic features, looks less modern human-like than Kafsa 9, even though they're found in the same locality, thought to be coming from the same time period. We've got a little bit more projecting zygomatic, we've got a more of a projecting superorbital torus, we have less of a rounded cranial vault, so more of a mixture of characters in Kafsa 6 relative to Kafsa 9. We can see this indeed if we continue to expand the sample from the Near East. Here we have School 5, again an anatomically modern Homo sapien, Taboon 1 and Amud 1, Neanderthal-like specimens, 
And the rest of this material, the Kafka and school material, are all considered anatomically modern Homo sapiens. But if you look across this range of specimens, you'll see that I've arranged them in terms of the degree of occipital rounding. In other words, how rounded is the back of the skull? Kafka 5 has an extremely flexed posterior portion of the skull, again a Neanderthal-like characteristic. We see similar morphology in Kafsa 6. By the time we come around here to Kafsa 9, we see a much more rounded globular vault. Again, similar to Kafsa 3, similar to School 1. But notice where the Neanderthals, or those specimens that are typically classified as Neanderthal, place into this comparison. Amud 1 has a very rounded posterior vault, as does Taboon 1 in actually this context. So when we look at these features in the entire assemblage in terms of the variation, what we see is a complex pattern. One in which, depending on which characters we look at, it's difficult to clearly identify and discriminate the so-called Neanderthals from the so-called anatomically modern Homo sapiens. And it turns out this is true across a whole range of characters. So again, it raises this question of, are we actually correct in identifying the Neanderthals versus the anatomically modern Homo sapiens? If they are a different species, how are they relating in time and space across this fairly limited geographic area? If they're not a different species, but instead different populations, how do we explain the evolutionary processes that are shaping the patterns of variation we see? Moving forward, we can look at actually some of the dentition from this specimen. Again, we have a specimen from Kafsa, typically designated as an anatomically modern Homo sapien, and two Neanderthal specimens, an earlier one from Taboon and a later one from Amud. All of these specimens have very similar broad dental arcades. If we look across these specimens. If you look at the overall size of the dentition, it's also very similar. The similarity in morphology extends even to how these teeth are worn. So how these individuals are processing their food, as observed via, for example, the heavy, flat wear across the anterior dentition, in all of these specimens is broadly similar. And indeed, if we look at the archaeological evidence associated with these different cave sites, we find that it's difficult to distinguish the behaviors of these specimens, even though in some cases there are distinctions in the kinds of tools they have. What they were using those tools for seemed to be very similar. The food that they were processing and eating seems to be very similar. So there are a lot of similarities, not just in the morphology, but potentially in the behavior of these individuals. We can look at the mandibular variation from supposed Neanderthals from this area to add additional insight to this question. Recall that Neanderthal mandibular morphology, at least in its classic sense, is very distinctive from that of modern humans. And you can see some elements of that classic Neanderthal morphology in Kibara and Taboon 1. The lack of a chin in both of these cases is a classic Neanderthal trait. The presence of a retromolar space in Taboon 1 and Taboon 2 is a classic Neanderthal trait. The coronoid process of the ascending ramus appearing above the mandibular condyle of Taboon 2 is a classic Neanderthal trait. But look at the chin of Taboon 2. We have a clear projecting chin on this specimen, despite the fact that it's considered a Neanderthal. Kabara lacks a retromolar space, even though it's a Neanderthal. Taboon 1 has a mandibular condyle and coronoid process of the ascending ramus that are equal in terms of the vertical height, with a coronoid notch that's sitting right in the middle of the specimen. In other words, modern human traits. So when we look at the mandibular variation in this rich, supposedly Neanderthal sample from the Near East, what we see is a range of variation and a heterogeneous mix of seemingly Neanderthal-like and modern human-like traits. When these materials were first recovered in the middle of the 20th century, the excavators actually thought that these were examples of hybrid populations, hybrids between primitive European Neanderthals and more advanced anatomically modern Homo sapiens. Since that time, that argument has fallen out of favor, and instead, the Near East has been viewed as a battle zone between Neanderthals and modern humans, where at times Neanderthal populations spread out of Europe into the southern Levant and came to occupy this area, only later to be outcompeted by expanding modern humans coming out of Africa occupying this area, and a sequential back and forth as the environment and climate of this region changed. However, that original interpretation, the notion that these might be hybrid populations, is more consistent with the evidence that we have today, including the genetic evidence that we've already introduced, in which Neanderthals may have been a very different population, but one that was still capable of interbreeding with an expanding modern human population. Now exactly the area in which that interbreeding may have occurred may have shifted across this area, as you had complex population movements and expansions both out of Africa and out of Europe. 
So in a contemporary context, we might think the reality is really a combination of these two historic explanations. The idea of Neanderthals and modern humans shifting in their distribution may in fact be accurate. But instead of conceptualizing them as two different species, it may be better to go back to the original interpretation and conceptualize them as two separate populations, strongly divergent but changing over time and interbreeding when opportunities existed for that to happen, when in other words you had expansions of populations and they came in contact. Again, this is consistent with both the morphological evidence and also the archaeological evidence, and also is consistent with the new genetic evidence that we have available to us. Now we might ask if these processes are limited to simply the Near East, this kind of unique junction point between Asia, Africa, and Europe. And so we can look at actually these processes play out within other regions. If we look at Saint Césaire, it has a number of features that identify it as a Neanderthal. This includes the supraorbital sulcus, a fairly projecting supraorbital torus, a little bit of prognathism associated with the mid-face. But many of these features also are similar to what we see in School 5 an uh, anatomically modern Homo sapien coming from the Near East. Again, we have a similar development of the forehead, projecting brow ridge, similarities again to some degree in the midface, but also similarities in terms of the morphology of the lateral aspect of the skull, including the zygomatic and the lower cranial base of these specimens. In other words, there's a lot of anatomical similarity between these late existing Neanderthal and a little bit earlier anatomically modern Homo sapien coming from the Near East. Now it's also important to point out that Saint Césaire is associated with an archaeological industry known as the Chattel Peronian. This is the last of the Neanderthal industries, but is unique because unlike other Neanderthal archaeological industries, it's not considered a middle Paleolithic industry. Instead, it's considered an upper Paleolithic industry. This distinction is made on the basis of the kind of tools that are present, including a high frequency of bone tools, a high frequency of microliths and blades, in addition to symbolic artifacts, like shells that have been pierced to be used for ornamentation. So in this late existing Neanderthal that has some combination of anatomically modern and Neanderthal-like characteristics, we also have an archeological assemblage that also appears to be more modern. One explanation is to think that, again, these early anatomically moderns that came into the Near East had an influence on later Neanderthals in Europe, that they helped shape the pattern of evolution in later Neanderthals, making later Neanderthals in some ways more anatomically modern, even as the overall Neanderthal morphology as a full package began to dissipate and eventually became extinct around 40,000 years ago. And again, we can see these processes play out if we look later in time. Here we have La Chapelle on the left, a classic French Neanderthal. And here we have Cro-Magnon, thought to be an early anatomically modern Homo sapien in Western Europe, in other words, in the same area of France as La Chapelle. And while there's clear differences identifying the Neanderthal from the modern human, notice, for example, the long, low vaulted Neanderthal versus the much more globular early modern human, the lack of a forehead on La Chapelle versus the prominent straight vertical forehead on Cro-Magnon, but also notice the similarities, the similarities of distinctive European characteristics. We have the high nasal bones on La Chapelle, a European characteristic throughout the Pleistocene and one we see replicated in Cro-Magnon. Notice the laterally facing zygomatics on La Chapelle, again a European characteristic in the Pleistocene and one we see replicated in Cro-Magnon. So it's possible to think of this replacement of Neanderthals by modern humans, even in Europe, even in Western Europe, the domain of classic Neanderthals, as one that's associated with population processes. A replacement of pre-existing populations by those of modern humans, but replacement that includes some degree of admixture, so that we see some preservation of Neanderthal-like traits, even in the earliest modern humans that we have in Europe, even arguably in modern humans that we have today. And again, recall that modern Europeans today take about 2% of their genetic ancestry from Neanderthals. So this explanation is consistent with the genetic, arguably the archaeological, and possibly the fossil evidence. In this framework, modern human origins isn't a question of speciation. It's a question of population processes. And it's much more dynamic in the sense that it involves the interaction of specific populations across time and space some of which may have gone extinct, some of which may have gone extinct but contributed some degree of ancestry to future populations, and some of which may have simply spread and continued to persist and are part of the overall tapestry of variation that we see in living humans today.